All right, turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 17. James chapter 1. And the scripture says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive the, with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man, un, or he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I want to preach tonight on how to hear sermons. How to hear sermons. Because it doesn't matter really so much on um, the oratory of the sermon. What matters is whether or not anything really of importance is done is whether or not people hear it. If you don't hear it, I mean, you don't get it, then it's not helped you a bit. We need to get it, and we'll be talking about that tonight. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I do pray, Father, that the Spirit of God would speak to our hearts and challenge us tonight on this matter. We are going to give an account for not just the things that we have said, but the things that we have heard, whether we were paying attention or not. Lord, I pray tonight that we would realize the importance of hearing the Word of God. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody has observed that God gave man two ears and one mouth because it's twice as important that he hears what is being said than he just adds to the noise. You realize the word preach or preaching is referred to 175 times in our Bible. But hearing is referred to, hear or hearer is referred to 1,500 times. God wants us to hear his word. He even tells us in Romans 10, 10, 17, faith cometh by what? And hearing by what? The The word of God. But we have to be willing to pay attention. I want you to look at just a couple of admonitions. Go over to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Now, Matthew chapter 13 is the parable chapter. Jesus tells a number of parables of the kingdom. Uh, But it's some of the things that he has to say between the parables that you need to get as well. Notice, for instance, beginning in verse 11. It says, And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, 
and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And then he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. If you don't listen on purpose, you will miss it. Go over to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, the last book in our New Testament. Of course, chapters 2 or 3, we have the letters of the seven churches of Asia Minor. The author of these letters is Jesus Christ himself, trying to get a message across to his churches. And you'll notice he says, for instance, in Revelation 2 and verse 7 to the church at Ephesus, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You go down to verse 11. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You go down to verse 17, and he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You go down to verse 29, and in verse 29, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You go down to verse 6 of chapter 3, and he says, He that hath an ear, Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Go down to verse 13. And in verse 13 he says, uh, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You go down to verse 22. And in verse 22 he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now go on over to chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 22. And notice verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. He wants us to hear with understanding tonight. You coming to Madison Baptist Church tonight, God wants you to hear what he has said in his word. I mentioned the other day in the message, if God says something once, we ought to pay attention to it. It's important. If God says it twice, we ought to really be paying attention. If he says it three times, but he says it more than once, twice, three times, more than seven times. Matter of fact, I didn't even read the passage in Hebrews chapter 5 where he talks about our hearing. God wants us to hear his word. He says in Proverbs chapter 28, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. God wants us to hear his word. God wants us to pay attention to his word like his word is important because it is. It is the most important word that is given on this entire planet. He wants us to hear it. On purpose, he wants us to get it. Now, listening skills are one of the most important skills to acquire and seems to be the least of the skills to be studied. We have people to learn how to speak, stand up before people and speak and try to get their message across. But as I have said many times, unfortunately, people do not listen to what you say. They interpret what you say. As a matter of fact, sometimes they're so busy interpreting what you just said that they're not listening to what you're saying now. And they get what part they interpreted wrong because they weren't listening to hear. They were, by the way, there's a debate coming up. I'm, I'm not sure when that's supposed to be between the presidential candidates. Let me tell you what every one of those news people are going to be doing, looking for something to find fault about. They're not going to be listening for anybody's message. It's not the message they're concerned about. They're looking for something to be said or missaid that they can read something into it so they can have a headline to put on their news outlet the next day. That's what they're about. And we have become great. We are experts at multitasking and good at nothing. 
my, we'll have the TV on, we'll have the computer on, we'll have a, the, the, the tape player on or the music player on. We got so many different things going on, we're not paying attention to any of it. And then you try to talk to somebody on the phone and can't even remember who it was you just talked to <laughs> or what the message was that you just got. Because we are multitaskers. We want to get so much done. As a result, we get nothing done. A lot of Bible preaching and teaching is wasted each time the church meets because people simply do not hear. In our SAT test that we give in our academy, <laughs> uh, one, one of the subjects, I mean, you've got math, you've got reading, uh, you've got sciences, uh, you've got a number of things there. One of them is listening. And one of the things you learn from the listening test is it starts when they're young, not listening. The listening scores are abysmal. They may do good at the other things, but boy, the listening scores, because mom and dad have never taught them to listen. Because mom and dad don't listen. Mom and dad are looking for the shortest way to end the conversation. All right, and I got it, I got it. Go on, play. Leave me alone, leave me alone. I'm tired of being mom for a minute here. But a lot of Bible preaching is wasted. And we've taught people not to hear. Uh, it was uh, said of Ezra, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel. You see, he was one of those men that he prepared his heart. He wanted to get the message of God. He wanted to understand it. He wanted to know how it applied to him and to put it into practice. He wanted to do it. But to do it, you have to listen. How should we hear? Three main points I want to give you. First of all, there's a ton of sub points, but three main points. How to react to God's word. Look at verse 19. Let's go back to James chapter 1. Verse 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. First part of that, be swift to hear. Now, this idea of hearing is not just hearing a noise. It's interesting, if you read the testimonies of the Apostle Paul's salvation, uh, you go back to what took place in Acts chapter 9, and the men definitely heard a noise. But he says later that they didn't hear. What he meant by that, and it's obvious from the passage, what he meant by that was they didn't understand the noise. They didn't get it. The message that Jesus spoke to uh, Paul or Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road, the other people didn't get. They didn't hear it with understanding. We need to listen and hear things with understanding. Every good gift, uh, to hear means to pay attention. Every good gift come, comes from above. Every good gift comes from above. That's what he says in verse 17. And the first gift, the main gift, the number one gift is the gift of salvation. Verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Now that's the first thing. Remember, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the most important gift right there that God can give. So it also means to listen with intention. You have to make up your mind to listen with the purpose of what does this mean to me? What would this require me to do to obey when I'm just hearing in the word of God? As I said already, we become experts at doing three or four things at a time and become masters of nothing. I know when I especially listen to the Spanish because my Spanish is not that good. But I have to listen on purpose. I mean, I have to listen on purpose. I start out trying to catch key words to hopefully give me the context of what's being said. But I'm listening on purpose because I want to get the message. I mean, if they're talking to me and I get one word, but if I miss one word... I might end up responding to something totally different than what I was thinking they were talking about. And I don't like to have to keep saying, huh? Huh? 
I'm sorry. No entiendo nada. No puede pensar rapidamente. Es imposible. That's it. No more. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you got every bit of that. Uh, be, be slow to speak. Turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to what? Hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil. You see, we need to understand we go to church, we're going to have to give an account for what we hear. And if we're not hearing to understand, and therefore we don't change, we don't obey it, we don't do what we're supposed to, we're still going to give an account for the fact that we heard it. We can't say, Lord, you didn't provide it for me. It's, I wasn't listening. I wasn't paying attention. And that's a shame. Boy, that, that shouldn't be like that. But notice he goes on. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. We got to comment on everything. I think one of the hardest things to teach, especially the young fellas, is just shut up and listen. I'm sorry. I, I was a young fella once, and I'm an old fella. And I find we still have some of that problem in us. You know what I mean? We hear somebody talking, and we're trying to think of how we're supposed to respond before we're even done hearing what they have to say. And just shut up and listen. Just listen. Form your thoughts after they're done. You don't have to jump in right as soon as the speaking stops. Think about it. Listen to it. Listen on purpose. Be slow to speak. The sacrifice of fools talked about here are those who simply go. They don't get anything from anything because they're not there to get anything. They're there to put in their required time in church. When we should be here to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us through His Word. He wants us to get it. The Spirit of God wrote it. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. He wants us to get His Word. He wasn't doing it for His well-being. He was doing it for ours. And He expects us to listen. And then He makes the interesting statement back here in verse 1. Uh, for He says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Boy, we're easy to get mad. We're easy to find offense. Somebody says, talks about something that happened. Somebody says, no, it wasn't quite like that. How, how does a person, an angry person respond? Are you calling me a liar? The word never came out of my lips. I mean, if I thought it was as serious as you lying and not just being mistaken, I'd have called you a liar. I didn't call you a liar. You want to start something? Slow to wrath. <laughs> it's, it's, boy, trying to change the conversation real quick. There are many very talented Christians who do more harm than good because they don't have control of their tempers. We got to get offended at everything. Just offended. And we have a verse about that, don't we, in Psalm 119, 165? Great peace of they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. What about that? That's a, now, there is a tough verse. You got to admit, that's a hard verse. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There's a biography of a former Major League Baseball player, Billy Martin. He played for the New York Yankees. And uh, he may have played for a couple of other teams. There was a while that he was a manager. He managed the Detroit Tigers, which was my favorite team growing up. And I had the opportunity when I was working in radio in, Mich in Michigan to interview Billy Martin. And I'll, I'll be quite frank with you, I, of all the Major League Baseball players that I had the opportunity to interview, 
for the radio station, I have never met one more full of themselves than Billy Martin. Now, some of you older folks who are baseball fans, you may remember that name. You know, he was one of those fighters, just a tough guy. But he was a very close friend of the great baseball player Mickey Mantle. And uh, Mickey Mantle and Billy Martin were going, they were in Texas, and they were going to go out hunting. And Mickey Mantle had a friend that often let him hunt on his property. And so he drove up to the man's house, Mickey Mantle did, and and he said to Billy Martin, you wait in the car, I'm going to go in and make sure it's all right with him that we go ahead and hunt. And so he, he, he went in to see his friend. He said, listen, I've got Billy Martin with me. And he said, uh, uh, we'd like to go hunting if it's all right with you. And the guy said, listen, that's fine. Be happy for you to go hunting on my property. But Mickey, would you do me a favor? He said, I, I have a mule that is six. The mule's gone blind. Uh, and I've had that mule so long, I, I, can't, I can't do what needs to be done. Would, would you mind taking my mule out and shooting her? She, she, she's just blind. She can't go anywhere. She runs into things. Would you please do that? And so Mickey, he says, well, sure, I, I'll, I'll be glad to do it for you. And he went out, and he thought he'd play a little trick on Billy Martin. And so he went out, and he got his gun out of the back, and Billy's saying, is the guy going to let us hunt? He said, no, he's not going to let us hunt. I can't believe that rascal would act that way. After all the time that we've been friends, I'm going to, he said, well, what are you doing with your rifle? He said, I'm going to go in and shoot his mule. So he went into the barn, and he shot the mule and killed it. And about that time, he heard, blam, blam, and he came out of the barn, and Billy Martin was walking back to the car. He says, what were you shooting at? He said, well, I decided I'd shoot two of his cows. <laughs> now, that's in Billy Martin's biography, which is probably like the Internet. It's got to be true. <laughs> but <laughs> Scripture says in Proverbs chapter 22, make no friends with an angry man, with a furious man, thou shall not go lest thou learn his ways. You better be careful who you hang around. You hang around angry people, and it won't be long you'll be one yourself. That's the way it works. And when that happens, you're going to find your speech not being edifying, not being uplifting, not even being helpful in any way, but it's going to destroy many good things. Marriages are in trouble. Because unfortunately, they don't know how to communicate with one another and listen. When they're talking, unfortunately, especially with the men, they're trying to figure out a response before she's even done talking. And that leads to another thing that I'm not going to get into today. How to receive the word. How should we receive the word? Let's get back to James, verse 21. He says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. There are many things in the Bible that we don't understand. And that's because there are many things that we cannot understand. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. We need to be able to tell the difference between that which God clearly says and that which God doesn't say clearly for a reason. Let me give you an example. When I went to Bible college, I had one teacher in the seminary that taught very plainly that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God were definitely, no doubt about it, were angels. No doubt about it. As a matter of fact, I had that teacher, he was asked the question, we were, it was systematic theology is what it was, systematic theology, we had this big book by Hodges, big book, very small print that we had to go through, and he was asked the question, can a person be an effective pastor without knowing systematic theology, he said, absolutely not, and then we spent a week on whether or not the sons of God were angels or simply the line of Cain, which were they? Well, then I had another teacher. His name was Dr. Barrett. And he proved conclusively that the sons of God could not have been angels. Both these were professors in the seminary. 
You say, what, do you, what are they, preacher? I don't have a clue, and I don't much care. It doesn't affect my life one way or another. <laughs> and I know guys, they think they've got all those things figured out. And now, I, you know, I think, right. I know, but I may not know, and I think that's one of those questions that when we get to heaven, a lot of us are going, oh, why didn't we get that? That wasn't that hard. But the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And the things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever. Now get this, that we may do all the words of this law. God's more concerned about how we treat the things that it clearly says. Because if you're not going to take the things he clearly says as he says them, then you're really going to get messed up on the secret things. Just don't worry about it. It's not important. Now, he tells us we're not going to know when Jesus is coming back. But when he comes back, we'll know it then. But we're not going to know ahead of time when he comes back. And yet people write all kinds of books predicting when Jesus is coming back. But nobody knows. God says nobody knows. Except God. God knows. I hope he comes back tonight. But I had an evangelist that was out of the college I went to that proved conclusively that Jesus had to come back in 1981 because the planets were aligning in the solar system in 1982. And the things that were going to take place on the earth, earthquakes and all kinds of things, 1982, was going to be, they lined up with the very things that will take place in the first year of the tribulation in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. And on top of that, Israel became a nation in 1948. And Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, a generation was 40 years. 1948, 40 years. 1988, seven years before that, you're going to have the, it's got to be the rapture. 1981. He had a trip to the Holy Land planned in 1982. He had to cancel that and reschedule it for 1981 so he could get it in. You see how ridiculous this gets? When you deal with things that God doesn't tell us, but the things that he has told us, we're going to give an account for those things. No, we'd much rather spend time with all this other stuff. You know, the numerology stuff. Do you know numerology proves the King James Bible? I don't need to know the numbers. I believe it's God's word. You don't have to prove it to me. And I don't think God used numerology to prove it either. Now, what if he did? Well, then I'm just slow. My math may be bad, but hey, my trust was right. This is God's word. Amen. And that's what counts. God's word is God's word. Hallelujah. That's good stuff right there. Thank you, Mike. All right. But understand this. You take a first grader. Most first graders do not understand algebra. Do you know why? They're first graders. That's why they can't understand it. They're alive, they're students, but they don't understand algebra. I know ninth graders that don't understand algebra. As a matter of fact, I know some who got their high school diplomas and they still don't understand algebra. <laughs> now, they probably could if they studied it, but they're not going to study it. They're out of school. They don't want that to be covered again. And that's okay, and they can have a successful life without knowing algebra. We get that. But there is a point. It's one thing that they're not going to even try to understand it. It's another thing if they're so young that they don't have the proper foundations laid to have a grasp, and their mind is not ready for algebra yet. They can't. Do you realize if you just got saved, there's a whole bunch of this stuff you can't understand yet. You're going to have to grow. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. we got to grow. So you get in his word, you study his word, you read the Bible, you spend time in it every day. The more you read it, the more you're going to understand it. The more you're going to see things that you didn't see before as you read it. We want someone to teach us everything. Well, get in it, read it, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, indeed, not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But if you're going to study the word of God, please do me a favor. Don't go to the commentaries first. Just get in the Bible. What does it say? He wrote it for you to get it. So just whatever he said, he's right. If you can't understand what he wrote yet, don't worry about it. It'll come. 
Just keep reading. Just keep reading. Just keep reading. I tell you, you want to get a good handle on the book of Revelation? Read the Old Testament. It's amazing how much of the Old Testament is referred to in the book of the Revelation. You don't need somebody's book on Revelation. What you need is the book on Revelation. God's book on Revelation. That's what will help you. Uh, they, the, too many times the commentators, I found this out. I've got a bunch of commentaries in my office. And the really difficult verses, that's why you have commentaries. But then you open up the commentary, he doesn't cover it either. <laughs> he didn't understand it yet when he was writing the book. So I might as just get back to the scripture and say, it'll come when God opens up my understanding. We'll get it. Listen. <laughs> he said, for instance, take lost people. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.15, the natural man receiveth not the things concerning the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto them. Uh, I lost the verse. I don't normally lose it in the middle of the verse. But uh, 2.15, but uh, let's see, verse 14. Uh, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. There are things in this book that a lost man cannot understand. And as long as he's lost, he won't understand it. Now, he can understand Jesus being born. He can understand he was born of a virgin. He can understand facts that he was born in Bethlehem. He can understand that. But there's other things he's never going to understand until he gets saved. It's amazing how much of my understanding was opened up just by getting born again. But that's where it begins. It begins at getting born again. So how should we receive the word? Number one, with a repenting heart. Lay aside all superfluity of naughtiness, all filthiness. Just lay it aside. Get it out of your life. If you're not willing to get clean, you're going to be stuck in your Christian walk. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sin has hid his face from you that he will not hear. Reality is, God, yeah, God wants to teach you. God wants to answer your prayers. But you're going to keep sinning in your life. You're going to be stuck on ignorance. And that's going to be the problem. You run into people all the time on visitation. Oh, yeah, man, I've read the, I've read the Bible. I've, I've studied that. And I, I've studied the Koran. And I've studied the Book of Mormons. And, I, and they mention all these books. And they don't know anything. They don't know anything because... The things of God are spiritually discerned and they're not spiritual. They're not going to know it. Here's an old Chinese proverb. This is not the Bible. It says you don't drown by falling in the water. You drown by staying in it. And a lot of people are messed up because they stay in their ignorance. They don't listen to learn. They don't listen to get something. Come as clean as you know you can discern ready to get even cleaner as God deals with your heart. Understand that all sin is against God. All sin. The little sin and the big sin. And to God, it's all just sin. So get your heart right with God. Do come ready to repent. Also receive it with a receptive heart. Verse 21, back here in James chapter 1, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness Notice, receive with meekness the engrafted word, with meekness. For to be engrafted, there must be an incision, a cutting. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This word cuts us, man. It cuts us deep. And you'll sit there and you'll burn a little bit. But that's all right. That's good. Take the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The word save in the passage that we just read here has the idea of preservation. It preserves us. The way we are preserved is by the Word of God. It makes us mature. It makes us complete 
in first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The difference between the wise man and the foolish man in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, the wise man heard the word of God and did it. The foolish man heard the word of God and didn't do it. The wise man who built his house on the rock heard the word of God and did it. The foolish man built his house on the sand. Why? Heard the word of God, didn't do it. Both of them had all the storms of life. Who stood? Who stood in the storms? The one who heard the word of God and did it. That ought to be our emphasis. Hear the word of God, obey it, do it. Hey, but I'm saved by grace. I don't need to obey the word of God. No, but building your house on the sands isn't going to make for a successful home life. Yeah, you're still saved by grace, but you're the one sowing the destruction of your home, the destruction of your life, by not taking the word of God to obey it. So you obey it, you make examination of yourself, verses 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is vain, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Then he tells us what to do. And to, besides visiting the fatherless and widows, but keeping yourself unspotted from the world. The reality is the world is looking for people who live their faith. Because it's what they see you live is what they truly believe you believe. There are a lot of people, they, they can talk all day, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but they don't live it. And you see, you're not living it to go to heaven, but since you are going to heaven, you are if you're saved, you ought to live like it so people can see your faith in action. So when people look at you, what is it that they see? When they see your daily walk, when they see you, for instance, at work, do you take part in some of the smutty jokes that they tell? Do you sit there and laugh while they're being told? Well, what does that say about your faith? Oh, that reminded you of an old joke you heard, and now you go and tell it. What does that tell them about your faith? You go out to Walmart. How you dress, how you act, what does that tell them about your faith? Where you're at. I mean, we live in a society that I believe is looking for some real people. Some real people who are what they say they believe, that they're living it. For that, we need to hear the word of God on purpose. Live it to allow it to change our lives. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' sweet name. And I pray you'd challenge our hearts, challenge our lives tonight. Dear God, please, do a work in us. And Father, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name.